please turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to be looking at verses 7 to 11. For those of you who haven't been with us, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, and we are almost coming to a close as we are continuing through Matthew chapter 7. The title of this morning's sermon is Petitioning in Prayer. And this is actually the second time that Jesus talks about prayer in his Sermon on the Mount. The first time was in Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus taught us what to pray through the Lord's Prayer. And here in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus teaches us how to ask. And so again, that's Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 to 11. If you have found your places, please stand with me out of reverence for God's Word. And please give your full and undivided attention to the reading of God's holy word, starting with verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone, and if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? This is the word of God. You may be seated. And let's once again bow our heads and ask God to give us help, insight, and illumination into his word. Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of prayer, and thank you for this call to ask, seek, and knock. We confess that we pray far less than we should. Praying is so simple that anyone can do it. Yet it is so simple that hardly anyone does it. We are so independent and self-reliant. And we usually ask only when we can't help ourselves. Would you humble us the easy way before we have to learn the hard way? Father, may we cherish this gift, this access to you that you have granted to us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we have various thoughts about prayer. And Father, as we look into your word, would you uh, not only teach us, but would you ingrain this in us? Would you give us the, the faith to believe that uh, we can come to you anytime, anywhere, and ask our Father in heaven, for good things. And so as your sons and daughters, help us to believe this. Help us to have faith in your promises. May we be a praying people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Corey ten Boom, she was a Dutch Christian woman who helped many Jews escape the Nazis from the Holocaust during the World War II in the 1940s, uh, she would hide many Jews in her home. And in one of her books, a famous quote that she gives on prayer uh, is this. She asks, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? What's the difference between a spare wheel and a steering wheel? Well, your spare wheel, it is literally unused until you get a flat. It just sits in the back of your trunk. Whereas your steering wheel, it is literally used every second that you drive. Last year at our Memorial Day retreat, somehow I got a flat tire. You know, I got all the way to the retreat center fine, but the next day, one of my tires was completely flat. Thank God I had a spare tire uh, because some cars these days actually don't even come with a spare tire. Um, and the spare tire that I had, it wasn't just a small donut spare tire. 
but it's actually a full size uh, spare tire. So our family was able to drive all the way home without any problem. You know, when you think about your prayer life, is your is prayer your spare wheel or is it your steering wheel? Do you use it every moment of your life, everywhere you go? Or do you look for it only when you run over a nail? In our passage today, Jesus is telling us to make prayer our steering wheel. He is imploring us not to keep prayer in the back of our trunk, but he is exhorting us to pray and to ask for help in steering and directing us down the very narrow path that he calls us to go down. We cannot steer down this narrow path without the help of this steering wheel, without the help of prayer. And so as we look at what Jesus says about prayer again, and more specifically what he says about asking in prayer, we're going to go over three main points about uh, asking in prayer. First, we're going to look at the command to ask. Second, we're going to look at the qualifications for asking. And then thirdly, we're going to look at the commitment to answer. So first, the command to ask. We see that Jesus, he tells us to ask persistently. Ask persistently. Let's look at verse 7 again. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Many of you are very familiar with this verse. And when we look at these verbs, ask, seek, and knock, many of you know that these are imperatives. But not only are they imperatives, they are given in the present tense. What does that mean? It means that uh, these present tense imperatives are not meant to be a one-time act, but they are meant to be an ongoing activity, a continuous activity. So, the New Living Translation of the Bible actually gives a better nuance of verse 7. And it says this. It says, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. How often do we ask once, maybe twice, and then stop and give up? I think the majority of our asking it stops after one or two knocks. Here, Jesus is teaching us to pray often, often. Uh, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus, he shares this parable about a persistent widow. So that, uh, he says in Luke 18 verse 1, so that they would always to pray and not lose heart that they would always pray and not lose heart. Jesus said that this widow, she kept coming to this judge asking for justice, begging for justice. And then so in verse 4 to 6, it says, Jesus said, For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Jesus gives this parable of a persistent widow to make the point that if a pagan judge will give in to the continual coming of a persistent widow, how much more will a God of grace give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Jesus teaches us to keep asking, to keep seeking, to keep knocking, to keep coming to him. Dare I even say, keep bothering him. Keep knocking on the door of heaven. Because that is what God wants us to do. Jesus actually gives another parable of sorts about a persistent friend. 
If you look at Luke chapter 11, this is where Jesus uh, teaches about the Lord's Prayer. And it's also where he teaches about this very same passage about asking, seeking, and knocking. It's a parallel passage to this one. Jesus gives these same commands to ask, seek, and knock. But right before he teaches about these commands to ask, seek, and knock, Jesus shares a story about a persistent friend. And again, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation because it's just a little bit easier to hear. But Luke chapter 11, verse 5 to 10 says this, Then teaching them more about prayer, he used this story. Suppose you went to a friend's house at midnight wanting to borrow three loaves of bread. You say to him, a friend of mine has just arrived for a visit and I have nothing for him to eat. And suppose he calls out from his bedroom, don't bother me. The door is locked for the night and my family and I are all in bed. I can't help you. But I tell you this, though he won't do it for friendship's sake, if you keep knocking long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need because of your shameless persistence. And so I tell you, keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open. What is Jesus trying to say? He's saying that this persistent friend shamelessly, boldly wakes up his neighbor or his quote-unquote friend in the middle of the night and his neighbor finally gives in to what he needs, not for friendship's sake, but because this neighbor is so persistent. What is Jesus saying to us? He's saying, if you knock long enough, he will get up and give you whatever you need even if your persistence is shameless. Jesus is saying, there's no shame in knocking on the door of heaven. Father, Abba, Dad, please give me what I need. And your persistence, it shows your desperation. Think even about the phrases, ask, seek, and knock. They're not horizontal words. They, it's actually a crescendo. There's an, an increased intensity even in the commands. If you really want something, you will ask until you find an answer. You know, about two years ago, only three months after moving to Pennsylvania, our youngest daughter, Faith, she was jumping on the bed and one day she hit the bottom of her lip on uh, the corner of the nightstand next to the bed. And so she gashed her uh, bottom lip. She was only two and a half years old. And so her lip was gashed inside and out. Her teeth on the inside cut the inside of her mouth and the outside was gashed by the corner of this nightstand. And I was at church my wife was at home with uh, our daughters, and this was around 4.30, maybe 5 in the afternoon. And what does my wife do? Obviously, she calls me asking because she is desperate for help. And what do I do? I start seeking for an urgent care because I, too, am asking for help in time of desperation. So I do Google search, and I find the nearest one. But the nearest one, I call their clothes. And so what do, what do you think I would do at that point. Do you think I'm going to tell my wife, uh, I'm sorry, they're closed. Can't do anything about it. No, I'm going to find another urgent care. I'm going to seek another option. You're going to call another place. You're going to knock until you get a response. And so the next one I call, they were open. And so we go there and, you know, I'm filling out the paperwork and they, they finally treat her and they take out little splinters of the pieces of the nightstand that were pierced into her lip. And they got them all out. And then they say, she's too young for stitches. And uh, they require glue to uh, close up her lip of her skin. But this urgent care is out of glue. So do you think at that point again, I'm going to look to my wife and say, honey, they're out of glue. 
Uh, we just have, to, just have to go home. No way! We're going to seek another option. We're going to knock on another door. We're going to call another place until we get a response. And so we sought another option. We called another place. And we went to another urgent care that did have glue, and they glued her skin together. You see, our desperation, it leads to our persistence. When we look at our prayerlessness, and when we realize we don't persist in prayer, what does that mean? It means that we're not, it means that we're comfortable. It means that our felt needs are all met. We're not desperate. We think that we have everything under control. But even Jesus, who did have everything in control, even he prayed persistently. Luke chapter 6, verse 12 says, One of those days Jesus went to a mountainside to pray and spend the night praying to God. And I think this is the proof text for many of our first generation Koreans to go literally to a mountainside to pray all through the night. Call that chariagi though, right? Because Jesus did that. He prayed persistently all through the night. Or Mark 135 says, And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. Another proof text for early morning prayer. Or Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplication with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Even Jesus, the Son of God, who had everything in control, he persisted in desperate prayer before his Father in heaven. How much more do we need to persist and persevere in prayer? Let us not fool ourselves, deceive ourselves into thinking that all of our needs are met. Now, you might raise a question of objection, and you might ask, well, does this mean God will give us whatever we ask as long as we're persistent? As long as we're like this persistent widow, as long as we're like this persistent friend, is God going to give us whatever we ask for if we just don't give up? Well, the simple answer to that is no. Notice, Jesus, he doesn't say, ask and you'll get whatever you ask for. He doesn't say that. He just says, ask and it will be given to you. He says, knock and it will be open to you. What is it? It is not necessarily what you ask for. It is not necessarily what you want. It is what God wants you to have. You will get what God wants you to have. And God will give, God will answer, God answers all prayers. He gives a sevenfold promise in these short verses, a sevenfold promise that He will answer your prayers. He says, It will be given, you will find, it will be open to you. Everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds. The one who knocks, it will be opened. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So sevenfold, he's doubling down. He's saying he will answer. However, you may not receive the answer that you desire or the answer that you expect. God may answer with a resounding yes, or God may answer with a no. God may answer with a not now. Moving on to our second point, what are the qualifications for asking? Again, God's not going to give you everything that you ask for. He will answer, but he's not going to give you everything that you ask for. And that's because the Bible gives us qualifications for asking. Imagine if God gave us whatever we asked for. You might think that would be the greatest thing that could happen to you. But that might actually be the most dangerous thing that could ever happen to you. 
there's a movie called Bruce Almighty, and actually I looked it up because uh, I haven't seen it in a while. It's actually a pretty old movie. It came out like 17 years ago, um, but it's starring Jim Carrey. Um, he plays this TV reporter, and after many weeks and months of going through unfortunate circumstances Jim Carrey he screams at God and he says you're the only one not doing your job and so God played by Morgan Freeman he shows up to Jim Carrey and he offers him the chance to play God for a week and Jim Carrey's ecstatic and he gains all of these God powers. And he uses all of these powers selfishly. You know, first thing he does is he makes his wife's chest bigger. Uh, he, he stops all cars so that he never has to face any traffic. And there's a scene where uh, there's like a million prayer requests uh, that's given to him through uh, email. And, you know, he's trying to respond to all of these prayers but it's taking so long and so he pushes this button just reply yes to all so there's like over a million prayer requests and he just responds yes to all and what happens obviously it just turns out to be a disaster imagine if god said yes to not only all of your but all of our prayer requests it would be the most dangerous thing that could ever happen to us. God has good reasons for not giving us whatever we ask for. Pastor Tim Keller, he says this. He says, God gives us what we ask or what we would have asked if we knew everything he knew. James chapter 4 verse 3 says this. says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So how do we ask rightly? Well, we need to look at what the Bible says as a whole about asking. And uh, there are very many qualifications about asking uh, the right way in the Bible, but I'm just going to give us five qualifications for asking, not wrongly, but rightly. And the first is this, ask in faith. Ask in faith. Matthew 22, verse, Matthew 21, verse 22, it says, And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. James 1 says, Ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. So it's not just ask and you'll receive whatever you want, but do we ask in faith? Meaning, do you trust in your father that he wants to give you what is best every time you ask anything of god do you trust that your father in heaven wants to give you what is best do you trust that there is a good reason why your father may withhold something from you is that trust there every time you ask that's one thing we need to discern about our hearts second Ask in his name. John 14, 13 says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 16, 23, In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Perhaps we have asked our Father for a million things, but we have asked nothing in His name. Maybe we've been asking everything for our name. But God's saying, not in Joe's name, but in Jesus' name, for His name's sake. And think about even the first petition of the Lord's Prayer. Hallowed be your name. Do you ask that God's name would be hallowed? Does my asking in prayer give glory to His name? 
or does it only give glory to my name? This is another level that we should think about in our asking. Thirdly, ask in relationship to him. John 15, verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Do we ask from a right relationship with our Father in heaven on the basis of a right relationship with him? Not just the fact that you are technically a child of God, but are you a child of God in good fellowship with him? Are you intimately connected to him? Or do you more often than not ignore your father most of your week or your month and and then only hit him up when you need something? No one likes those kind of people, right? That only come to you when they need something. God doesn't want to just be a means to an end. God wants to be the end that we are seeking. So before you even ask for what you want, the first thing you need to ask for is an abiding relationship with Him. Do we even ask for an abiding, connected, intimate relationship with Him? I don't want to give my daughters things if they only treat me like a vending machine. Let me push these buttons and then I'll get what I want. I don't want to give them things if they treat me like a vending machine. We need to have a tight relationship first. Then I will more than want to give them the things that they need. And so think to yourself, with all that God may have withheld from you, are you abiding with him? Fourthly, Ask in obedience. Ask in obedience. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what, he, do what pleases him. Ask yourself, have you been obedient? Now, this is not saying that God's giving is conditional, that if you obey him, then he'll give to you. That's not what it's talking about, but it's talking about love. Because John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. What Jesus really wants to get at is your love. Do you, do you even love God? Or are you just using him? Again, are you just treating him like a vending machine? Your obedience is not so much a condition but it's a character of your love for your Father. Ask in obedient love to Him. And fifthly, ask in His will. Ask in His will of 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So are you asking for God's will, or are you asking for your will to be done? Again, even Jesus prayed, not my will be done, but your will be done. You know, you might have one through four all down, but if you don't have number five down, then he may not give you what you ask for. We could ask in faith, we could ask in his name, we could ask in relationship to him, we could ask in obedience. But if it's not in his will, then it's not meant to be. And what is his will? Oftentimes we don't know his will. We obviously don't know his secret will. But what we do know is his revealed will. We do know his revealed will. And he tells us what he wants us to ask from him. In his word, he has already revealed much of his will to us. And so we should ask not just what we want, but what God has already revealed that we should ask in his word. In a sense, we should pray, 
God's prayer requests to him, he tells us what to ask for in his word. You know, he, he tells us to ask him for wisdom. James 1.5, he says, If any of you lasks, lacks wisdom, let him ask God, and who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. So he tells you what to ask for. He says, ask for wisdom, and I'll not only give it to you, I'll give it to you generously. Ask that you would grow in wisdom. The Bible says to ask for salvation. Romans chapter 10 verse 1 says, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Ask for conversion. First and foremost for yourself if you are not saved, but for those also around you who are not saved. Ask that God would transform people's minds and hearts. Ask that doors of the gospel would be open. Why would God not answer that prayer? Pray for sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, it says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So he already explicitly reveals his will. This is the will of God for you, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. So pray that you would abstain from sexual immorality, that you would be pure, that you would be holy, that you would be set apart. He says, ask for workers, kingdom workers. Matthew 9, verse 38, he says, Therefore pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Not just praying for volunteers, but for laborers, workers for his mission. And we saw it very recently in Matthew 6. He says to pray for the kingdom. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And so as you evaluate all the things that you ask, is it according to his will, according to his revealed will? Or is it, Always according to your will, my will, what I want, what I think I need. So Jesus tells us to ask according to his will, and he hears us. Now lastly, let's look at the commitment to answer, Father's commitment to answer. And we see that God, he wants to give you the good things. God wants to give you good things. Matthew chapter 7, verse 9 through 11, it says, Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Next week, uh, our first daughter, Joy, she turns seven years old, and she's about to start the second grade. She's just growing up too fast, that's what all parents say. And as her father, don't you think that I want to give her good things? Do you think that for her seventh birthday, I want to give her a bag of rocks? Do you think that I want to give her a snake? Of course not. I want to give her good gifts. All fathers want to give their children good gifts. The only ones who want to give their children bad things are psychologically disordered. Even evil, sinful, depraved fathers want to give their children good gifts. If an imperfect father like me wants to give my daughter, good things. How much more does our perfect Father in heaven want to give us the best things? Your Father wants to give you the best. The limited love that I have for my daughter, it cannot compare to the love that God the Father has for you. He loves you so much more than I love my daughter. And He wants to give you so much more than I can give my daughter. 
James 1 17 it says for every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change God's heart is to give you good things but the problem is that what is good to God may not seem good to you what is good to God may not always seem good to you I think I've shared this illustration before, but uh, when you have a baby, every couple of months, you need to bring your baby to the doctor to give them their immunization shots. And as a parent, you know that these shots are good for your child, but all your baby feels is pain. All your baby wants to do is cry. And if your baby could talk, they would ask you, why are you putting me through this suffering? Mom, Dad, why are you piercing me in my side? Similarly, we are these babies wondering why our Father in Heaven would allow us to experience different levels of pain and suffering. And on the micro level, we'll never understand why. Just like a baby will never understand why they need to be pierced in their side. As human finite beings, we will never understand on the micro level why we have to go through pain. But on the macro level, God says, it's ultimately for your good. Psalm 119 verse 71, the psalmist says, It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. And he also says in verse 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. We don't know why we go through pain, but sometimes God allows us to suffer in order to keep us dependent and reliant upon him. Because, again, our default, when we are comfortable, our sinful nature, our default is to deny God. We overestimate our ability and we underestimate our need. And so Hebrews chapter 12, it says that he disciplines us. Hebrews 12 verse 11 says, For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Sometimes, God allows us to suffer so that we would boast in Him alone. The Apostle Paul asked three times for his thorn to be removed from his side. 2 Corinthians 12.8 says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God may allow some of you to suffer. God might allow some of you to stay single. That might be your thorn in your life. God might allow some of you to become terminally ill. That might be your thorn in life. God might allow you to lose a loved one. That might be your thorn in this life. But Romans 8:28 says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Genesis 50, 20, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. God might give you earthly suffering, for an eternal good that we don't yet know or understand. 
And we must know this about God, that God took the very worst to give you the very best. God took the worst to give you the best. Romans 8, it continues by saying in verse 32, that he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If, if you're really rich, and let's say you're willing to give someone $10,000, isn't giving $10 so easy? $10 is nothing compared to giving $10,000. Let's say you're a billionaire and you're willing to give someone a million dollars. Then giving $10,000 is nothing. It's like nothing in comparison to a million dollars. Our Father in Heaven, He was not only willing, but He gave us the costliest gift He could ever give. The gift of his own son, Jesus Christ. On the cross, God willingly gives up his son to have us. And if God gave us his son, how will he not graciously give us all things? God said no to his son so that he could say yes to you and me. God gave himself the worst so that he could give you the best. Eternal comfort, unending joy, unfathomable riches, perfect health, unbroken fellowship. He will wipe away all of your tears. He will take away all of your pain. He will give you a glorified body and He will make all things new. So just wait a little bit longer. Wait a little bit longer. The best is yet to come. And in the meantime, keep asking your Father for strength to persevere. Keep asking your Father for faith to believe in His promises. When you're walking down this narrow road, when we, we see everyone else going down the wide, easy, comfortable paths, ask Him to give you faith to walk down that narrow path. Keep asking for gr greater desire for Him above all the glittery things of this world. Know that He is leading you to paradise. Don't allow even good theology to prevent you from prayer. Don't even allow God's sovereignty to prevent you from asking. The sovereign God calls us to ask, and He says that our asking works within His sovereign plans. So ask. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, knowing that all these things will one day be added unto you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Before I close us in prayer, I just want to give you a minute to pray, to ask, to seek, and to knock on the door of heaven to call out to your Father in heaven who wants to give you not just good things, but the best things. Would you ask him things in his name, things according to his will? Would you ask him for strength, would you ask him for salvation and sanctification? Would you ask him for workers for his kingdom? Would you ask him for a renewed mind and a heart? 
that would not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but would be renewed by the transformation of our minds, that we would know what His perfect will is. So let's spend a moment in prayer asking Him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you who are sovereign and in control of all things, you still call us and command us to pray, to ask, to seek, and to knock. We don't understand how our prayers are incorporated into your sovereign purposes, but help us to obey because you ask. Father, help us to ask according to your will, according to your word. Father, may we seek you more than gold or silver. May we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, not our own. Father, help us to be your kingdom workers. Help us to be dependent and reliant upon you. Take our eyes off of making a place in this world keep our eyes on making a place in heaven father we want to delight ourselves in you lord we want to desire you more than anything this world has to offer we thank you we pray this in jesus name amen